Welcome to Talk Save Culture Talks, the podcast of Paradisec, the Pacific and Regional Archive for Digital Sources in Endangered Cultures. I'm Jody Kell. And I'm Stephen Gagao. These are conversations with people who have personal and cultural connections to the languages and music in our archive. This is a special episode that will present historical recordings that are over 100 years old. The recordings were made on wax cylinders in the Hula region of Papua New Guinea in 1904. They have recently been digitized by British Library as part of the True Echoes project, and listening to them, you get a sense of stepping into the past and hearing voices from a world that has changed. We are excited to be able to share excerpts of these significant recordings with you as I am joined by Hula speakers Roge and Gulia Kila and co-producer on this episode, Amanda Harris. Amanda Harris is the Paradisec Sydney Director and a Senior Research Fellow at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, University of Sydney. She is a partner investigator on the True Echoes project. Amanda advocates strongly for connecting heritage recordings with speaker communities, and she has been pivotal in working with and interviewing Roge and Gulia Killa. Roge and Gulia Killa are members of the Papua New Guinea diaspora community in Sydney. They are husband and wife and often travel to PNG to visit relatives. Roge hails from Hula village in the Rigo district, central province. His father was of Siligo clan, sub-clan Ruaolo, and his mother from the Kwamonuma clan, sub-clan Oala. Roge grew up in Hula, locally pronounced Vula, in the 1970s and attended primary school in the village. Like most children of that era in PNG, subsistence farming and fishing formed an integral part of his village life. Upon completing tertiary education in PNG and then the USA, Roge has been working as an international oil and gas professional, both in PNG and overseas. The history and cultural practices of the hula has always stimulated Roge's interest through stories told by his parents, uncles and aunties, and other older relatives. A tale of significance in his family is that of his paternal great-grandfather, Ola Vavine, who was a party in many Christian expeditions led by Pioneer London Missionary Society missionary James Chalmers during the heady times of the late 19th century PNG. Gulia Killa, nay Sam, comes from Babaka village, locally pronounced Papaka, a few kilometers northwest from Hula. She comes from Patagolo clan, sub clan Kimulu. Gulea also grew up in Babaka during the 1970s and completed her education while traveling through Port Mosby and Morobe province, where her father was a school teacher. She has a keen interest in the history of the local area, especially how her ancestors lived in the area. Most of her recollections on the way of life was told to her by her grandparents. The full interviews with Roge and Gulia are held in the Paradisec collection, TCT1, as well as videos of their musical response to the heritage recordings. But now I hand over to Stephen, Amanda, Roge and Gulia for a fascinating conversation that stretches into the past and what these recordings mean to people today. In this episode of Talk Save Culture Talks, we're going to listen to some very old recordings, some of the earliest sound recordings made by ethnographic expeditions. In particular, we're going to hear songs that were sung in Hula Village in the Rigo district of Central Province of British New Guinea, now known as Papua New Guinea. These songs were recorded on wax cylinder by Charles Gabriel Seligman during the 1904 Daniels Ethnographical Expedition to British New Guinea and are now held in the collection of the British Library. We at Paradisec are collaborating with the British Library 
and the Institute of Papua New Guinea Studies on a research project funded by the Leverhulme Trust. The project, called True Echoes, is working to reconnect living communities with these old recordings, to understand what they mean to people today and what they tell us about the past and the present in Papua New Guinea. Photographs of Hula Village in the early 20th century show that people lived in overwater houses built on tall stilts. This is the context for this kind of song that would be sung up to the occupants of such a house. Awaraku Rogelka Rogelka Kila Awiku Vanuga Ula Ula Vanugana Ula Vanugana Central Province I Emma Pagave my recording the Kagakavara early nineteen hundreds or Kunan Lane or late eighteen nineties on a Kalara Akamanagida on a Kilakira Kilagira him. So basic basically I was just saying I'm from and um, we're here today to talk about the, some of the recordings that were done about a hundred years ago. Our Kugulea, Kulea Kila, Aga Kovanuarana, Babaka, Etoma, Iparawomai, Lani Kunina record in Rikitagere Kalato, Aga Aga Gupuagia. So I basically said, um, I'm Gulea from uh, Babaka Village and the Hula, uh, Hood Point Peninsula, and we're here to talk about some old recordings. Thank you. It's beautiful to hear, hear language when we starting off, talking about old recordings that were partly about getting that language on record and and recording songs in particular in these yeah. ones. So just to point out, Gule is from Babaka village, which is not far from my village. And the language, the dialect is a little bit... So we, we speak a kind of similar language, but the dialect is different. So yeah, you hear a, the, the tonalities are different. different. Mm. Yeah. Speak, yeah. And would everyone understand yeah, but we between understand. those? Yeah. yeah, 100%. But yeah, so I, I grew up um, in, the, in the village all the time uh, when I was growing up and... You know, that's the time when you're kind of like, um, you know, grow up as a um, person you know, with a family, you know, because it's, it's you got to do everything and in the village. You learn a lot of stuff about your village during those years. Mm. Um, pick up, you know, what's been done, you know, how things are done and all that. Uh, so I think that was a... It was good. I was very fortunate to grow up like that mm. uh, because, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s. Um, of which I think at the time was a big, you know, um, a transformational in the history of PNG. You know, 75 was when we uh, got independence from Australia, but but also, uh, you know, people were changing, you know, the way they were living from, you know, like the 50s, 60s, and then there were more clothes coming in into the village and all that type of thing. Into the well in, into the eighties and then that's when I went to high school. Mm. So I'm directly linked to the one founder, of one of the founders, through my my mom, mm. my mother's great great grandfather. I mean, I can read the whole line, line, lineage, lineage up to the, the, like the, the seventh. Yeah. And who, who is that? Who is that? So the, so <laughs> so the two founders were Leva Louis and La Louis, and and Leva Louis through his, you know, children. Mm. And you know, my um, my mother was um, six or seven, you know, in the generation. Oh, I'm the six or seven, I think. Yeah. Was Wula the language they would yes. have spoken as well? So yeah. Wula, Wula was the language, and it was interesting. Like, I think the the, the language had a, had a lot of similarity to to the Kapara language, which is Hula. across the bay. On the other side, where the village was initially located, mm. um, so that, that that's the 
listening to the the um, tapes, I could yeah, clearly I could tell. tell that the language has shifted a lot from the the Kepara yeah. Kepara Lukuni, which is the village. The Lukuni is our village. Hula originally came from from somewhere else to do Alukuni, and then from Alukuni to Hula itself. So the language. That we do, they still speak the same language, you know, over, over in Alukuni, the, uh, the dialect is is um, you can tell the language has changed because the the, the from the recordings the the songs that we we had they're very Alukuni um, words, mm. very yeah. strong like, Alukuni or Kapara words are very very prominent in the in the songs. So, like for instance, uh, the word for like to speak or talk like. They say Ila, but then the whole last, like sort of, yeah. and the K, K, and so they so say Kila. We say Kila. Like our se- like surname. Like yeah. my surname. So my surname is Tok. Yes. It says Tok speech. Sign it. Pitching. So they say Kila and the, yeah, Kea Para say Ila. Ila. Ah, who last time? Sung only by the older folk of both sexes. <laughs> There's a lot more words in in uh, hula or kapara uh-huh. uh, language in this in this one. It's a lot, uh, and it's about courtship. Yeah, oh, that's it, why you were laughing a little. Yeah, bit. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's some <laughs> <laughs> some words. Uh, you know, like you're under the house, and you know the the. Wait, so know. this is this this particular one is done by men. It's mostly about uh, singing to a woman. It's kind of like a the it's sun sun. In a in a, a guy singing to a girl, mm-hmm. so to speak. Yeah, in this instance. So the his, the word the son. I think we call it raw. I think that was what they uh, titled it as, which is later. You know, like we can wait later, later. So it, <laughs> at the end of each verse, it says raw, raw, which it's which is later, later. later. So he keeps emphasizing wait. that not now, or wait. You know, some uh, one of those. <laughs> One of those words. <laughs> um, so that, that it's it's um you know like about about that basically uh, a person uh, a guy is you know calling to a uh, a girl and you know wants to I guess just wants to take her out or some you know something along along those lines and and um you know she's saying later later. Uh, so that's her voice at yes. the end saying raw, later. Raw, raw. In the, uh-huh. yeah, it's yeah. sung by the guy, but yeah, that's basically that's the story. Yeah. Sto- okay, the, that's story the story of that is, yeah. 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 And yeah, it also makes reference to, um, you know, how he may have gone in a canoe, yeah. you know, and he's, you know, the, how the canoe is like beach, you know, the, right? and the tide's gone down. Tide's so gone down. He so can't go, but he has to wait. Wait. Um, yeah. Until the tide comes up. So, tide comes up. Uh, he's, so, he's stuck. So he's right? he's come, but she the... can't get down. <laughs> get down and go with him because he, he's been, be- it's been beached yeah, or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. 
I mean, that's what we kind of like uh, took out from those verses. We have to listen really carefully to. So where are you gonna? I mean, where are you gonna go? And go. how are you gonna? Let's hear yeah. what saying. Are you just gonna stay? Stay and, and wait, just wait. Wait it out. Wait it out, or you know, just yeah. wait. <laughs> There's an emphasis on later. You know, like, like raw wow. Raw wow is a raw is later, but raw wow is kind of there's an emphasis to it. Like go away or something like that. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's about um uh, yeah, yeah but it's in like Kepara. Yeah, mostly Kepara, which because I mean it's it's a Hula language, so that, that's why I was saying like Hula language has changed uh, a lot over the last hundred years, you know, from a lot of I think they dropped a lot of those K's in the in the in the language. And it, became more silent you know um yeah but it's it's mostly uh kapara um in this kapara language in this which is where we hula originated from so man i mean our village you know hula is is uh well i could say it, it's it's a it was a marine village you know it used to be on the stills mm. and then they moved on to, moved on to land that. um so there's some still some houses over over the sea but you know, the, our, our our life just revolved around uh, fishing and a bit of gardening, um, you know, making gardens for you know vegetables and stuff like that. I don't. There's not too much going on there that now at the moment because the village has has grown and you know a bit more develop. Um, I don't know if it's development, but you know, change. Mm. So yeah, but but uh, you know that was the primary activity. So everyone has to learn how to fix a net or. You know, operate a motorboat or pedal, or whatever. Stuff I've like. seen some photos of all the houses built on stilts. Yeah. Yes. Is that what it looked like when you yes. were a kid? Yeah. Yes. Oh, did you of, live in a house like? No, I didn't. I didn't live in a house. My dad had already uh, moved. Yeah. Um, moved built a house on, on land. So, yeah. but I, you know, my relatives, their houses were on uh, over the sea. So yeah, there's still some some there, and. Um, it's a, it's, it's got its advantages and disadvantages of living, living in there, you know, because the, the uh, footpaths, I mean, the little, little uh, walkways, walkways, is kind of made from bits of wood floating around. So you gotta, you know, it's a bit dicey. Yeah, 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 dicey. <laughs> walking down those. Um, but yeah, I think they were built back in the day for, you know, um, so we believe in a lot of spirits and those type of things, you know, That's sorcery scary. and. Uh, spirits and safety reasons. So yeah. for safety reasons, uh, a lot of the, the water. houses were built over the sea. The second song we're going to listen to also revolves around fishing and life on the water. But as Roge and Gulia tell us, listening to it tells us not just about how to fish, but also about the trade winds and seasons that guide the rhythm of life. It also helps us understand why this song in particular might have been recorded at the time the expedition visited. The expedition too was being carried by these same trade winds. Song sung in Nakaana's house before the turtle net was put upon the canoe. Ula. <laughs> This one's um, <clears throat> about uh, 
fishin fishin and i think at the intro it says turtle turtle hunting uh, or before the turtle net i think the who was speaking at the intro said before the turtle net is put this song was uh sung so it's basically so it's, it's about it's we can tell it's about fishing um so there's a, the first verse is like it says that um the uh, you know you're about to go out to fish uh, and the old man is waiting we wait you know basically saying that he'll be waiting for you guys to bring fish back um and then it's they're talking about uh, so it's basically talking about the actual fishing uh trip you know per, you know they stay back in disguise go out um you know i'm gonna see a fish on this side of the canoe or on this side of the canoe um it's the interesting bit is that they they have reference to a particular place in in the in the wood lagoon uh they Kepara. named the capara they named the actual river, river. Mm. the the um lagoon it's a lag we call it hood lagoon so they they named the mouth of the hood lagoon they clearly it's clearly stated there and it says they're gonna cross the hood lagoon so at, at this present time that that lagoon is there and the village of capara is on one side of the lagoon and when they travel from port mosby by car they have to park their cars on one side and then ferry, across. ferry across there yeah, yeah, on the a dinghy or, or canoe across so they're, they're talking about this back then that that they had to cross the rio y which is the name of the, the river. river or the, the mouth of the lagoon and then go and um smoke their fish you know for preservation and all that they, they go and smoke it across on that so they, they they said we're gonna cross we're gonna get the fish and we're gonna uh, make fire and smoke the fish. So there's a specific um, place that they are into, it, which is quite interesting because that place is a car park now. You know, they park the cars and then <laughs> go across, and that was the place where they were actually smoking all the fish. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. All that. But that particular uh, reference here, you were saying, like, since your uncle. You know, did like a lot of turtle hunting. Yeah. Like, this is some of the things that you do, like, especially for like turtle hunting, you know, leaning on or setting the light on a certain side or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. That's uh, in the nighttime. Oh, nighttime in the nighttime. Day, you get, get, get um, uh, light. like a coconut, you know, they, they, uh, so it's talking about uh, light, light, shade of light. Mm -hmm. So when you are hunting it, or fishing at, at night back in the day, they never touched. So they would uh, wrap um, coconut fronds. They would uh, weave them, yeah. and then they put probably, you know, ten of them on the out trigger mm -hmm. and head out, and then light light the thing to see the fish and spear. shoot them, spear them right. And once it's almost better, pick the next one up and light mm -hmm. it. So that's it's it's it talks about that. That bit now, yeah, mm -hmm. I forgot that, yeah. So Lenten, Talks about, yeah, yeah Lenten, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I kind of missed out on that growing up, but my did, my dad did tell me about the, the hunting with the, you know, like, lighting up the coconut, coconut phones, yeah. Mm -hmm. so we missed it, we were, we were in the spotlight era. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plugging in a 12 volt battery. Yeah. I was asking yeah. before when you were talking about learning to, you know, make the nets and everything, whether you sing with it, because I was wondering about songs like this, yeah. whether people might sing something like this while making, yeah. getting the net ready or making the lantern yeah. or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there were songs that, yeah, talking about the winds, also, you know, we got to get back before the winds pick up, you know. And that was the same for, like, gardening as well. Like, there were, like, mm -hmm. I mean, there were chains too. Mm -hmm. Like, so certain people would grow, like, like, the harvest would be really good, like, especially for yams. Yams. Yeah. yeah. So they had chains for that. They were going to get a Green hands, huh? Some yeah. of them, man. Very good at yeah. planting and yeah, and they so had chance for that. Yeah, they had chance for that. Yeah, as well. Like that's what I Talked when I first it. had that, and I actually gave it a lot of thought, you know, <laughs> in putting this because it's 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 quite detailed, <laughs> detailed, you know. Well, it's also sort of what you were saying before about um, keeping the knowledge about things that yeah. you're doing alive through the song. Yeah. So in a way, it sort of teaches you how to the process of going yeah, out yeah, to do. Yeah. The turtle catching or the yeah, fishing yeah. by yeah. documenting it in the yeah. song and then singing that song over and over again. Yeah, going out early in the morning. That's what that's what they say. Early in the morning, 
I wonder whether it's this, yeah. It's, mm. they do, they do. Oh, but then, you know, like, you know, like songs or like net, when you're landing the net. So. Mm. But then, you know, when you go out to fish as well, you know, I mean, even the, they call out. You know, yeah, yeah, we call, call to the fish. Oh, here we are, you know. Here we are. Is, here comes your yeah. feed, you know, come and take it. Yeah. And they call out. We say those. Yeah, they, I had my things. father say it, so I say it. I still yeah. say it now when I'm out there. Yeah, sometimes like, like when, uh, yeah. You know, I'll say that, you know. Children here, like, kind of like, it's like call what a are fish you saying, like, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's like, sounds funny. <laughs> Do you yeah. sing, sing that or you call it? I just I, call it. Yeah. Uh, call, call there's uh, some, you know, a couple of things that I had my father say, so I say them as well. And he probably had it from his father as well. Eh, lova kea, rakai kau munera. Amu kuarai pia wana ne, nera ya wana ne. Apia, apia, kuluvenia, balaya, rapuru kiru kia. Oh, we've been waiting for a while now. Where are you? A free meal has been offered, absolutely free for you. Take it, take it, charge at it. Hit it and rip the line apart. So this chant can be done when the fishing is slow or when you get the baits out on the water and everyone's kind of sitting around and waiting. The sequence of the words that I've used in the chant can be interchangeable and said in various orders. Each person has their own way of personalizing the, the chant and doing the call. The main objective of the chant obviously is to try and call the fish to come and take your line. But in addition to that, uh, we're trying to psych up everyone, you know, break the silence. A random chant can easily create a lot of energy and uh, motivation, you know, to keep fishing for a few more hours, um, you know. And that's always, uh, you know, a big thing for us uh, out there, you know, quite lonely uh, on the water. Some people yell it. Others say it in a loud voice, um, but the main thing is to get it going, and, and it, it, it's a good vibe, you know, among the, the fishermen there. It, it creates a lot of really good vibes and you know, a lot of energy, and people are always laughing, and, you know, and then when the fish bites, you know, it's even better. Yeah, it's kind of like you know, psyching yourself up, uh, well, psyching, well, psyching up well, the fish. Yeah. So the, the local fish also listen to that. <laughs> yeah. It's good yeah. speaking with nature. Yeah. So that could be like a chant. You yeah, know? chant. Yeah. 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 Fishing yeah. chant. Yeah. But we do that because we had it from our parents. parents. Yeah. My father my did family. that. You know? So it must have been something. We had it from his father. Yeah. yeah. And it done all that stuff. So, so for big expeditions, you know, they would go for like days and, and weeks months, yeah. and months. They, they'd go out there and then uh, catch fish and smoke them because that's one way to preserve them. Smoke them and then go go along way, catch, smoke, catch, smoke, and then go up to uh, up with the Motuan people. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Mm -hmm. It's further up. Uh, we're on the south, the southeast of Port Mosby. Mm -hmm. So we'd go past Port Mosby and go towards the north uh, northwest coast. And trade with the people up there and come down. Go just use the trade winds. Oh, yeah, trade winds. by sea. Yeah, 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 by sea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. it was all by sea. Yeah. Mm. So, incidentally, the, the True Echoes project uh, that's the route that they came from Torres Strait. Uh, and this is where, as far as where they used to trade, mm. trade yeah. up there. So, the, up to Barena, you know, the further up west. Mm. They, they, that's how the trading Got patterns was. Mm. So the, that expedition was following those yes. trade winds at the same time of year yes, as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 it would have to be because when the southeasterlies blow during mm. the um, uh, middle middle of the year, it's it's quite difficult to uh, navigate on mm. on water. So you gotta kind of like time it with the winds. It's yeah. seasonal, right? So you gotta yeah. time the you know when the southeasterlies come in, they're really really strong, and then the southwesterlies. During Christmas period is in the in the opposite direction, pretty so, much. So what's the time of year that those trade winds? So so in the middle of the year, being probably I'd say, uh, June, July, August. Mm. That's probably as 
the heaviest southeasterlies to pull. So, you know, people in the village know like what type of fish you eat and, you know, what to do at the time. You know, those those things are like, kind of like ingrained, ingrained you know. <laughs> and that's the first thing. The wind controls your life as a marine person. You know, every time you wake up, you say, oh, it's coming from this side, oh, it's, it's slowing down. And so those those old recordings, did you know about those before your know, very recent discussion? No, I did. I didn't know about that. It was, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a keen interest in the history of the village and, you know, just the history in in general in, in PNG. Um, so when I was talking to Stephen some some time ago, and and he, he mentioned the. Like, oh, you know, we're looking at some guys. Like, oh, if you ever come across any, any hula, hula <laughs> recordings, I would be really interested to <laughs> hear them because I want to see, you know, what language was used at the time and, and you know, what the, you know, does the, because the songs at the time would capture the events at the time, right? Mm. Events at the time, the culture, the, the, um, feeds or whatever at the time. Because all, all, all our songs, I'm pretty sure it's Stephen and other places. The songs capture a, a uh, an event, a time, some names, mm -hmm. uh, names of places, names of people. Um, that still goes on. So I was keenly trying to hear, you know, hopefully they mention some names. I didn't really hear any, but the language was, uh, well, there was a, a reference to a guy in, in one of the, which I had had, had about. Mm -hmm. Growing up. Yeah, growing up, there was a like a chief of the village. His name is mentioned in in the introduction of the one of the songs. Mm -hmm. So right. I said, "Oh, okay, I remember the name, name. This guy's name was that in the village, and he actually sang the sang the song. He's the one singing. Yeah. According to the, the yeah, yeah. Intro, yeah. and then uh, yeah, that, his name is kind of known in our village." And known as a kind of story chief, from yeah, chief, yeah, from chief. my parents. Uh -huh. told, my 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 dad, my dad and uncles told us about the, those um, the na name the people and you mm. know, who was the chief at the time and that, yeah. Mm. So that that was one of the things that I picked up on and I I, told, I called my cousin. I said, hey, you know what? I had the name Gimaleva. His name is Gimaleva. In a in the record, it was done like a uh, hundred years ago. He was really keen, and I said, oh, "I'll, you know, we'll talk later about this." But I'm just letting you know that I've had this. He was, he was quite fascinated. Yeah. Yeah. The True Echoes project aims at reconnecting indigenous communities with historic audio records of sung and spoken cultures of Australia and Oceania. In this episode, we undertook participatory research with Roge and Kuliakila from Hula region of Central Province, Papua New Guinea, who are also part of the Sydney PNG diaspora community. The music and language is central to indigenous identity. Listening to legacy audio recordings taken over 100 years ago has demonstrated the emotional and exciting rediscovery of the past and captures contemporary perspectives on history and culture.
thank you to Roge and Gulia, Amanda and Stephen, for such an interesting discussion, sharing stories of the past. And how amazing are those recordings from 1904? It has been an honour to be involved. And we would also like to thank our collaborators on the True Echoes Project, the British Library and the Institute of Papua New Guinea Studies. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. If you would like more information about Paradisec, the work we do and the online catalogue, you can visit our website at www.paradisec.org.au. Talk Save Culture Talks was launched as part of the United Nations International Year of Indigenous Languages in 2019. We would like to acknowledge the support of the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language and the University of Sydney, the University of Melbourne and the Australian National University, as well as the Lieberholm Trust who fund the True Echoes Project. 